So good afternoon, good afternoon to everybody and welcome to this uh, FSR online debate on implementing equality and inclusion in workplaces. Uh, a quite atypical, uh, let's say, subject, but uh, a very, very important one. Uh, we know, we all know, and we all realized how important it is to ensure equality and inclusion in workplaces. Uh, we are even at Florence School of Regulation. We have, uh, as you know, uh, a gender mainstreaming uh, program called Lights on Women, but it's uh, wider and wider the uh, understanding and uh, the need to make sure that these uh, uh, two very important values are effectively implemented. Um, at the same time, it's uh, still a bit, uh, let's say, to be discussed what we actually mean with equality and inclusion. There is There doesn't seem to be a uh, univocal definition for either of these terms. And that's why we are also so much interested in, uh, in this debate today. Uh, we will go really at the core of uh, equality and inclusion. We will also uh, discuss very importantly uh, how the several gender policies that uh, uh, institutions, companies, uh, different kinds of entities have, uh, have been working on and have been implementing uh, what are their limits, what are their the benefits that they manage to ensure, but also uh, how they can be improved, if they can be improved. And uh, I'm really, really pleased to uh, discuss these issues with you today. We have a, a distinguished uh, a list of speakers that I'm going now to introduce one by one. Uh, we have with us Silvia Manessi, uh, she is the head of HR at uh, ACER, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators. And Silvia will be uh, giving the main uh, introductory presentation on these topics. Uh, after that, uh, we will have uh, um, a discussion. We will open a, a discussion and uh, uh, we will start with the first round of introductions uh, by uh, starting with uh, Elisabeth Politzer. Elisabeth is a managing director at Portia, which is a, a non-for-profit organization promoting uh, gender equality, but she's also been uh, very much involved in a youth funded project called Genesis, uh, where she's been working in particular also on, uh, jointly with uh, CINEA on a survey. And um, then we will have Andrea, Andrea Lenauer. She is uh, uh, the chair of the Women uh, in Energy Initiative at ICER, so the International Confederation of Energy Regulators. And she's also working for a national energy regulator in Austria, e control where she is senior advisor for international relations. Uh, then we will have Constanza Hermanin, and here we are uh, is in-house uh, knowledge that we have. Uh, Constanza is a, a research fellow at uh, the European University Institute, and she directs the Inclusive Leadership for Sustainable Governance Initiative. And she's also the founder and president of Equal, which is, uh, as the name suggests, um, an initiative promoting uh, uh, equal opportunities when accessing work. Uh, last but not least, Annika, Annika Bentner. Uh, she's a land uh, evolution manager and portfolio management uh, uh, at uh, Landwerme, which is a, uh, a company based in Germany, it's an energy company, particularly uh, working on biomethane and also uh, an FSR donor and lights on women donor. So um, this said, I think we have all prepared for an interesting discussion. I also invite uh, all the participants in this uh, debate to contribute with, uh, of course, uh, your own uh, experience. And also, if you have any questions for our uh, panelists, please do not hesitate to write them in the uh, Q&A box. Um, starting also, I mean, as soon as you have a question, and uh, I will uh, make sure that uh, the these questions are uh, picked and uh, responded by the panel. Uh, this said, I think we can give the floor to Silvia, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Idaria. Thank you for the welcoming. I'm going to share my uh, screen, uh, and uh, I hope everything will work. Fine. Um, let me see. Let me let me know if you see it. Mm -hmm. Let me do like this. Is this okay? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. My presentation will be brief. It touch upon three uh, main areas, divided in three main areas. A bit of an introduction, a bit of digging of what really gender means, 
and um, a bit of a discussion on, on, on the different aspects of genders. And then I have uh, prepared a set of three uh, quite provocative questions uh, for the panelists or for, you know, um, raising up a bit of discussion, okay? So, um, as I said, a bit of an overview on, on gender equality, on inclusion uh, topics, on uh, uh, everything that is uh, quite high on the agenda of uh, each organization at the moment. I'm an HR manager, so this is something that came in the field of HR quite uh, heavily in the past years. Uh, as you may recall, as you know, studying the history books, uh, the first uh, probably uh, movement uh, uh, related to gender, uh, are related to a uh, stream of uh, uh, equality of rights. So aim to uh, arrive to the same equality of rights, voting rights, uh, um, soon, soon before the, the First World War in Europe uh, with the suffragette. But uh, the topic of the, let's say, end of the um, uh, 19th century, beginning of 20th century, it's definitely related to having the same rights so that people with the different gender have the same rights. And this evolved a bit after the second world and it not, was not only uh, a matter of equality of rights, it was a matter of equality of treatment, uh, equality of being represented in politics and uh, in the end also equality of pay. I think with regard to the equality of pay there is still a bit of a struggle uh, unfortunately. Uh, but around the end of the 60s, beginning of the of the 70s, uh, uh, this was uh, a topic in the agenda. And since this two movement, you know, is really trying to push boundaries in, in this equality, this inclusion, this, you know, fostering diversity, then it's really not only uh, before the 90s that uh, um, we start thinking that maybe the gender issue is not a topic uh, per se, but it's something that needs to be enshrined in all policies and that we need to really have a, a gender perspective in, in, in every single uh, topics in an organization, in our uh, social life and so on. So this is really, for example, in the field of HR, is really in the 90s that the, that the gender topic is uh, coming quite uh, heavily uh, on the table. Now I've put down here a couple of uh, sentences, really. I know this debate is not about that, but uh, I know we all know this is quite high, uh, particularly in Italy uh, nowadays, uh, a topic that relates to gender. This is something that probably doesn't impact uh, the work life of a nature manager in any institution or organization, but the violence against women is still uh, a, a plague of the society and is still uh, uh, something that, uh, that uh, we witness with horror uh, on a daily basis. Maybe just a couple of things on this uh, topic. In, um, I, I will uh, maybe put uh, a link in the, in the chat. In 2014, the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights ran the, uh, I think, the, the biggest mm -hmm. survey on the violence against the women, uh, encompassing uh, 28 member states and around 42,000 mm -hmm. uh, women were interviewed over the phone. And the result of these violence against women survey were shocking. So <laughs> one out of three women in Europe was a victim of a form of abuse that could be from a psychological abuse to sexual abuse. And then we all uh, remember well um, the Me Too movement, uh, which is uh, to an extent still ongoing, uh, which you know stemmed from uh, um, uh, you know happening uh, around the year 2017 um, in the. In the Hollywood, it start with the Hollywood uh, movement, or, or, you know, and then it, it, it became a bit bigger. So this, I just wanted to, you know, share this too, so that we have on the back of our mind that when we discuss about gender equality and gender topics, there are some serious, uh, some serious aspects that are still <laughs> in need of a, uh, being addressed. Okay. But when it comes to the gender topics or the, the gender policies in the workplace, for example, it's called gender mainstreaming. So it's it's uh, having a strategy, as I said, uh, that that could be enshrined in every aspect of the policies of a of a said institution of a said organization, and uh, is aimed to 
a right to have gender equality. So it, it's basically uh, encompassing that gender is into uh, the preparation, the design, the implementation, the uh, monitoring uh, and the evaluation of all the policies uh, related to work environment or, uh, or in institution environment. Uh, and it's aimed to you know, foster uh, inclusion and combat discrimination. So this is, I think we are all clear on how are we gonna achieve uh, you know, inclusion or, or gender equality? But uh, um, the concept of gender, I am afraid is still a bit sometimes vague, even in organizations that are you know, up and running and have a lot of uh, um, actions uh, related to uh, gender mainstreaming. I just uh, put in this slide a, a couple of uh, examples on the policies document of the European Commission and just an extract from a Google search on uh, gender mainstreaming policy, just to show you that the gender uh, within a working environment uh, regarded as men and women okay so you see for example the strategy of commission of equality between uh, women and men by the way this is in the founding regulations of uh, most of the uh, agencies and institutions and uh, also when it comes to united nation it is still really uh, addressed to be a matter of men and women but I think with this debate, uh, we are called to see, is it really so? <laughs> so I came across this very, as I put it in the slide, adorable and digestible model for understanding gender, uh, which was invented uh, a few years back by Sam Killerman. He's a, a comedian and an activist uh, in the field of uh, equality and inclusion. And he has tried in an adorable way uh, to show the different aspects of gender, just to highlight that gender is not only male and female, uh, woman and man, but it's a bit more complicated than that. And I will explain in, uh, within one of my questions, the first one actually, why is this important nowadays? So first of all, there are, let's say, three for sure, maybe four dimensions of gender. Uh, I will start with the biological one, which is a straightforward one. You see it's number three in the, the list. So the biological sex is uh, what we are, uh, we were born with, okay? So female, male, or intersex, depending on the chromosome, okay? That's pretty straightforward. Then there is the gender identity. The gender identity is who do you think you are? So, uh, what identity, how do you identify uh, with which gender you identify? And, and there is not a dichotomy, as you could see, it's not a woman and man, but uh, it's a spectrum. And the same spectrum you have with the angle of gender expression. So you identify and then you express your identification or you express the means uh, what do you want to show yourself you are. And uh, as you may imagine, and as you can see there, there is a plethora, the spectrum also of wording describing either identity, identity or expression, and then of course the biological sex. The fourth dimension is related to sexual orientation. To, to an extent, it's a bit less related to the gender in terms of identity and expression, but is whom are you attracted to? Will this uh, really make any difference uh, in the uh, gender policies? Maybe to an extent. It's a dimension of a gender expression and it's also a dimension of diversity. So that's why it was included uh, in this uh, uh, gender bread uh, explanation. Okay. Um, so now I'm, I'm moving to the three questions that I have prepared. Uh, just to let everybody know that I do not have, have a reply to these questions. <laughs> I was lucky enough probably to be the first one, so I put the questions there for the panel to help. But I think it's good to have some reflection around it. So the first question is, of course, do we understand this complexity? Or are we still uh, leading into the dichotomy uh, woman or, or man, or even less so, so feminine and masculine, or even more so women and men. When I see gender policies that are aim uh, to foster gender diversity, 
where the diversity is identified on the sex of the person, so whether I'm a female sex, then I'm, I'm questioning, is it really an inclusion policy or not? Already with the dichotomy, um, male and female, but even more so if you think about some, uh, some of the latest um, uh, polls and research, and, and research that have been done on the so-called uh, Generation Z, which is the latest uh, generation of um, uh, workforce that is coming now into into our our uh, our organizations, and uh, uh, you see uh, in these two polls, one was run by uh, Ipsos Mori and one was a Gallup poll. Uh, and there you see that the gender fluidity, so the moving away from the dichotomy female and male, is really something that is sticking and is increasing with Generation Z. So it's something that is growing around us. And uh, in any policy of uh, inclusion, we will need um, uh, we will need to take into consideration. Okay, so if the complexity of gender was not probably the main uh, uh, worry of an HR officer uh, 20 years ago, nowadays is becoming more and more. It's very difficult if you want to have my views to balance uh, when you have so many things still to be done uh, to, uh, to balance the gender female male to also include a different direction. But uh, uh, the first question is really, do we understand and we acknowledge that there is such diversity or we are still uh, one step behind? So I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for a second and I'll give the floor to any of the panelists uh, who would like to help me uh, with this question. Yes, I see there is a raised hand from Elizabeth, and then I think also Andrea has uh, raised her hand. So, and then Costanza, we go in this or order, and then maybe Annika wants to, to close. <laughs> okay, so shall I start? Please. Okay, so, uh, so the question is about understanding the complexity, and I think the complexity is much more complex than actually rela related to the one particular characteristic, which is sexuality. Because what is missing and where uh, equality applies and non-discrimination applies is things like a combination of uh, your sex, sex sexual, sexuality with age or ethnicity or uh, race or disability. And I just worry that this focus on sexuality is just diminishes the importance of the other characteristics. So we can talk about young women, old women, premenopausal women, uh, black women, Muslim women, or men, or so on. So I think the complexity is much greater, and uh, in certainly in a, a, there's a much more talk now about inclusive gender equality, but, and that does then introduces into the how we perceive ourselves and how we are perceived by others, all the other important characteristics. Okay, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Andrea. Yes, hello. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, what Elizabeth was just saying uh, really resonates to me. Uh, when I prepared for your question, I wanted to say that complexity, yes, we can understand complexity always because we have the capacity to understand it. Uh, it's our human brain. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but, and when designing policies, we need to not be complicated, <laughs> but simple, right? So reality is complex. We can use models to reduce this complexity, one kind of uh, possibility of a model would be to talk in values. So when I hear gender policy, when I hear inclusive gender policy, this sounds for me values like trust or tolerance, uh, um, respect. Yeah. So we can talk in values. This reduces complexity. And then this brings us much closer to our goal. So what do we really want, right? 
So yes, complex, but not complicated. Thank you, Andrea. Costanza. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, um, Silvia, because I loved the presentation, the images uh, you chose, and, and also the approach inclusion, your um, attention to to uh, the issue of violence, which is so important and has also many interactions with, uh, with the workplace. I had two short comments on this and I will stick to this first question. Um, how do we understand and address complexity? Um, it's difficult. From what you showed, uh, we can uh, uh, very well see that there is a legal level that is reflected in the policy documents that you shot. Um, at the level of the European Union, for instance, whatever is hard law, enforceable legislation that you can bring to courts, still speaks of women and men. And this is because there are some member states of the European Union that would oppose putting the word gender into enforceable legislation. So we are stick we stick with that problem, which is a political problem. Um, gender is there, we all know, and is used by politicians and is used in some of the non-binding parts of legislation, like the preamble, et cetera, uh, but is mainly in soft documents and it is indeed underdefined. But one of the reasons why it is underdefined, and it is my second point, which is an issue for us as well, is that if we talk about gender equality and addressing it, we need to operationalize it. And we don't have data, simply because our data protection legislation, but also simply the methodologies we have so far, do not allow us to count the different dimension of gender and sexual orientation and uh, gender identity that we would like to um, address. And uh, this is something I don't really have a straightforward reply uh, to. Of course, through surveys, we can certainly do a lot, but in order to understand complexity, we would also need uh, a larger uh, data sets. So there are some first steps done by the Fundamental Rights Agency, for instance, but we need not to underestimate these aspects of data. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, just to comment on what um, Elizabeth said, this is also one of the main boundaries in addressing intersectionalities to me. So sorry, I raised more complexity rather than providing answers. No worries, Constanza. I think complexity is one thing we are not will not be missing today. So, <laughs> Annika, please, your comments. Yes. Hello from my part, and thank you very, very much. I also like the slides, and I really love the uh, gender breadth you presented. And regarding your first question, I think that organizations don't fully understand the whole complexity yet. But I think complexity should never keep us from acting. And above all, we should never, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, I think, we should never offset one dimension of inequality against another one. And well, nevertheless, gender policies need to evolve as well, because it is true that so far, gender policies often um, oriented um, or were oriented at a binary system. So we need to make sure that our policies become more and more inclusive. But I think in general, focusing on, as already mentioned as well, values of how we want to work or live together and um, evolving our policies and focusing more on individual humans than categories. Um, I think we can maybe work with this complexity somehow. That's great. Uh, thanks to each and all of you. And Silvia now will provide some reflections on your comments. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I think I got uh, all the points that, uh, that, that, that were made on this question. As I said, I don't have an answer myself. Um, I am taking a few of, of the things I uh, capture. Um, we discussed about complexity, intersectionality, data, the policy, the legal basis. Okay, these are all different dimensions, which are going to bring me to the second question, in fact. Um, where are our efforts? Okay, so if we have identified that, okay, binary is not really the right uh, way to go, we are dragging along with the uh, legal documents, legal policies that are still in need of, of data and definitions. And we will never catch up uh, in our effort to have everything done the way in which we would like to implement at the same time. So when it comes to the effort that uh, uh, we put in, for example, a working environment or a, a life of an organization or an institution, uh, we will always be in the limbo of a legislation that is uh, dragging along to first uh, have a definition and then have data and then decide. But then we live with the reality, as I said, of a new generation that do not necessarily recognize this complexity. So the, the second question is whether we need to retailer our effort. And in particular, uh, who are the stakeholders of a gender policies? Because uh, it's, it is, you know, in my experience that everybody comes around the concept of gender at a different pace and time in their life. There are some that they had the aha moment uh, uh, coming into a workplace. There are some that uh, believes I understand everything and then, oh, maybe not. So we have multiple stakeholders with multiple experience, multiple interest in gender policies. And uh, we speak to a very diverse audience. So the question is, uh, do we need to retail our effort? Do we need uh, to go into defining more? Or do we really need to move away from trying to define everything? If the uh, integration inclusion is not done on the ground of gender or on the intersectionality issues, or on, does it in the end really matter? Or we need to tackle why we don't include and what does that mean? So again, the second question is uh, uh, more uh, about, you know, the effort that we're making in the field of gender or the field of uh, inclusion. Do they speak uh, the same language? Do we need to speak different language? And how do we stand, you know, among all this uh, that chronic dimension of, you know, policies that cannot be really legally updated with what's going around in the, in the daily uh, job? Okay, very clear. Let's see who would like to go first, Andrea, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, very inspiring question again. Um, yes, I think we need to retailer our efforts uh, in the way that we have to reflect our aims and policies on a very regular basis, because uh, nothing worse than a policy when it's uh, published, I'm thinking of lengthy European uh, institutions, processes, it's already outdated. So how can you uh, uh, do better? I would say talk to people, you talk to the target groups, you talk to the workforce you want to, um, you have, you, uh, you, you want to, um, you create a, a better workplace, for instance, so talk to people, ask them what are their expectations, what are their needs, and you will have it, and you don't need data for it. Okay. I, Andrea, are you still there? It's frozen. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm still there. You're still there, okay, um, because your video was frozen for, for a few seconds. Ah, okay. So good, okay. good that you're here. Okay, great. Talk, so, talk to people, my message. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, Elizabeth, please. So I think when certainly one has to not so much retailer, but tailor the efforts to uh, make workplace uh, inclusive and a welcome diversity of people who, who uh, participate in the, in the workplace. And But there are now uh, a, a number of uh, very good examples 
uh, where this is being done uh, really effectively and under but finally enough under the umbrella of the of the phrase of equality diversity and inclusion so it's not so much on the gender policies but i, I just feel that there's been re reframing of uh, of the uh, of the problem and the most of the organizations that we work with or are interested in which are basically in research and innovation they have policies on gender on, on, well they have a policies edi policies so equality diversity and inclusion but most important thing that one needs to do and what people already are doing is to actually understand what sort of a policy will work in, in a particular workplace, yes, because that will be different. So organizations like Elsevier have a responsibility as an employer, but also responsibility to the science uh, community for uh, how they uh, make uh, knowledge accessible. So on one hand, they look at their own employees and consult their own employees to see what is it that they can do for the employees but they also have to work with the editors and authors and reviewers and so on. So there are many, there's not just one, well, you have a responsibility as an employer, but certainly in research, you also have responsibility of, uh, if you are a research funder, whether you are actually, uh, don't discriminate in how you allocate funding. So it, I would say the tailoring is the most important thing and there you have to ask like why this policy is needed, where the impact is going to be, who is going to take the responsibility. Uh, um, so who is going to be monitoring the process, when and what kind of results are expected. So in a sense, a theory of change with all those questions would help to tailor the efforts and make sure that actually they are realistic either the policy can be implemented and, and results can be demonstrated. So that's basically would be my recommendation. A very um, practical, pragmatic recommendation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Annika. Thank you. And a very good question indeed. Um, in general, I think I can agree completely um, with Andrea that I think um, the most important part is to listen to people affected by certain dimensions of inequality instead of speaking for them, giving them basically a seat at the table and this way becoming more and more inclusive. And in general, I think it is important because maybe as a company, you don't have people in your scope of action um, you could ask and maybe inviting external experts and inviting people to give them a voice and make them heard and in general creating corporate cultures that empower people to raise their own voices um, so that they are, will have the courage to actually speak up and design and redesign cultures and policies because I think it is important to keep in mind that first gender policies were often still made by men. And although they might have moved into the right direction, um, we learned that it is so important to hear the voices of women or gender queer or transgender people to actually become inclusive. Great, thank you. Um, Costanza, please. Thank you. Thank you very much also for the second question. Um, also here I have um, two points. Um, the first has to do with uh, corporate culture and uh, human resources management when it comes to gender equality. I think that when we try to formulate uh, recommendation solutions and new thinking, we really need to always keep in mind the fact that the majority of uh, the corporate world in Europe is um, composed of a small and medium enterprises and that uh, either you elaborate very uh, straightforward toolkits and not too costly or otherwise it's it's difficult to to pass on and to convince them to uh, put a lot of efforts and money into this kind of 
policies. Uh, obviously, legal and uh, policy constraints, reputational constraints uh, work, uh, work a lot. So there is an, an environment that needs to be built up, just as it was done for um, environmental impact and um, environmental um, considerations and uh, externalities. So I think we should learn something from that parallel in order to make the issue salient and addressed at all levels and not only in uh, public um, environments or big corporations. The second point, which in part, um, I mean, uh, <laughs> which is difficult to implement vis-a-vis -vis the first, but I still want to make it. Uh, um, gender equality um, and the responsibility of companies vis-a-vis um, -vis gender equality is larger than uh, when it comes to human resources. Um, part of my work is uh, devoted to enhancing the understanding of uh, what gender budgeting and gender their impact assessment are. And this means to bring um, the impact, internal and external impact of company activities on gender equality and inequality uh, to light. And only part of this has to do with human resources and how people, individualities feel within an enterprise, which is of course very important, but companies are actors within the broader society. So there could well be a policy, a toolkit to address the impact that companies have on the broader society. And here I very much uh, align with what uh, Elizabeth has just said vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Elsevier and the research institution. You need to understand for whom you create value and for whom you might not create value, even to the point of enhancing, enlarging inequalities. And there are instruments to do this, to understand what kind of value you create. And I think that's a policy I I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work to enlarge the scope of, of this understanding of gender equality um, within companies. That's very clear. Thanks, Costanza. If I may add one more reflection before Silvia um, responds to all these questions, <laughs> uh, is actually, um, yeah, so I think it what very clearly emerged is that Yes, there is a maybe a need to tailor or retailor the efforts, but sometimes it's very difficult to having to deal with reality of things. And many obstacles have already been listed, no uh, legal constraints, budget constraints. Um, I'm wondering also what role the mentality of those who actually uh, have are uh, you know um, have the need, have the task to of taking the decision to engage in retailoring efforts um, what's what's the impact of uh, you know the really the the understanding so does the understanding of uh, decision makers um, play an important role so much that it can really impede uh, developments positive de developments in this sense because we are you know there are I think at least two dimensions two levels uh, the basics we understood that you know it's good to have uh, gender inclusion policies but then this seems to go a little bit beyond and maybe a bigger effort is required silvia yeah thank you uh, thank you thank you everyone <laughs> uh, for the replies uh, uh, for me debates around this question on the effort creates even more questions but uh, um, maybe some reflection from what i'm uh, capturing um, i take it from where you you left ilaria um, about the understanding, uh, as I was saying before, if for gender uh, equality, we understand that putting somebody who was born a uh, woman <laughs> in different places in the organization uh, uh, create a gender balance, I think we are really off, uh, off track there. 
I also recognize uh, that uh, imbalances in gender or inequalities uh, may be leveled up uh, with a bit of a sometime push. Um, like, for example, as I, as, I, as I put in the very first slide about the Me Too movement, it was quite controversial. There were other movements about uh, political representation in the 60s. They were controversial because they picture an idea of women which actually do not really uh, fit all the culture or different culture of the, the women in the different culture. So there is always a bit of a, a controversial uh, angle to it. And there is a bit of a pushing the boundaries, which can can be a bit too much at the beginning, but maybe maybe it's needed when you when you claim your space, um, you need to use your elbow a bit. OK, or well, this is this is quite uh, normal. I think it's pretty much established nowadays, although there are many studies uh, also in, in the field of economics uh, that there is there is a business case for gender equality in organizations. So organizations that are more inclusive are organizations that are performing better. Now, having taken all these uh, elements though, uh, my impression is that when we discuss about policies or effort and so on, we are focusing on the on the how, you know, how are we going to do it in, in the short term or medium term. And, and sometimes I feel myself a bit uncomfortable, like, OK, it's a very good discussion. But at the end of the day, what's the final aim? And this is where I come to my third question. What is the final goal? And I have asked myself, uh, as 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 a woman, but also as a as a HR professional, these questions many times. What what is it that we want? I have two daughters, and uh, I'm wondering about the future. What would be the you know what would be the opportunities that they could have and I couldn't? Will 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 this be the case? Huh? But then, really looking long long term, what is it that I uh, would see this uh, as a final goal. And to me, um, the final, my reply to this question, which I think I have, is that I would like in the future that gender or diversity is regarded as a, a feature that doesn't have anything to see with the performance of your duty, with the way in which you interact with the other, that is like the color of your hair or the color of your eyes. It doesn't really matter how you identify, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter whether you are a, a, a woman of 50 or a young man of 20. This should matter like the color of the hair. Okay, so that would be, let's say, my suggestion for this diversity is that the diversity is recognized, but in the end it's not so recognized, like it's not something we really focus on, that we put, uh, we put a definition on, okay? Maybe putting a definition helps to foster the, the, the understanding or to foster the idea of why we are all different. But at the end of the day, should not be a label forever, okay? It should be just a transition. And in mm -hmm. the end, if I think about in 100 years time, nobody will really care whether I'm a female or not, or whether I'm LGBT or not. You know, I, I will be definitely included as I'm included now with the, you know, color of my hair or, or my eyes. And uh, uh, maybe before uh, I, I give the floor to the panel, um, I have a sub question, <laughs> which is uh, uh, again, uh, um, uh, quite, quite provocative. Okay. So there is a, uh, uh, an assessment of where we are. I think in many, mm -hmm. many of the policies I've seen, there is a bit of a lacking of where we want to be. But imagine we want to be really in a place where gender is regarded as a normal, you know, whatever feature. How do we get there? There is a process and of course policies and of course studies on intersectionality or understanding and so on are there, but then should we just move forward for them? Because otherwise this mm -hmm. labeling may create even biases. And I want to share with you this video, which I will now leave 
<laughs> Tobiris to help me with them. Uh, because when it comes to really do some philosophy, I always, uh, um, I, I, I'm a, a Blackarian uh, philosophist and I'm, uh, I go back to what the children <laughs> think, because I think they can teach us a lot. This is a nice video. Uh, it has a label uh, on it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's created by, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, company for uh, beauty products, but it's a very nice video. And maybe it's uh, a bit food for thought. Uh, before replying to the questions. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. Mm -hmm. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean. Yes, I kick like a girl, and I swim like a girl, and I walk like a girl, and I wake up in the morning like a girl, because I am a girl. And that's not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm going to do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? Okay, uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, maybe, um, you know, before leaving the, the, the floor to the, to the question, where are we uh, going? Maybe a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, pictures that I, I, I found interesting from this video. Uh, it's quite emotional. Um, you see, you know, people of the, you know, adults in the video, they have a very good uh, idea of what run like a girl mean. But if you see children, uh, they kind of now questioning, like, okay, it's like a girl, like an insult or, or what? And no, I'm, I'm not insulting my sister, I'm insulting girls. So um, the question is that with all this policy, the definition, the, you know, going into the complexity, the specific, are we losing the focus on <laughs> what is it? We don't need to label, we just need to move away. We Are, are we running as fast as we can? Um, and to me, I don't know, maybe the reply to this one is no, but uh, I, I leave the floor to the panel. Thank you, Silvia. Yes, very emotional video. I could see some... <laughs> Yes, um, impact uh, on all of us. Uh, thanks for showing it. Um, let's start from Elizabeth. Okay, well, thank you for this video. Actually, I was watching it and thought, gosh, how American it is and how, how, how it depends on the stereotypes. And if that such a video was made, I don't know, in a Jordan or a Korea or Japan, it probably would be quite different. It basically 
plays out the, the fact that we are affected by stereotypes. But you know, babies a few months old already make a differentiation. They can they recognize the person that is the carer and the person who might just play with them. So this, so we have to recognize that there are those that we. So when the, when the question says, you know, what is the final goal? We have to actually understand what are the big barriers into actually achieving any goals. And I think the goals have to be achievable. Otherwise, we just continue talking about these issues forever. And one thing that I always also uh, strikes me is that when you listen to people with disability, they don't want to be identified by their disability. Okay, they want to be say, treat me like a we treat anybody else. But people whose uh, focus is on their sexuality want to be recognized and prioritize the fact that you know I'm transgender and take me on like this. So um, obviously the personal identity is hugely important to people, to everybody, but it is influenced right from the moment we are born by the culture and the environment in which we live and uh, 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 brought up in. And so the final goal would be for me, just real understanding and being really inclusive. Even, even I have been struggling what inclusive as opposed to diverse, as opposed to equal means, but I'm beginning to sort of understand really it's in being inclusive is being tolerant and accepting and not feeling like you have to judge a person. So we have to, basically the goal has to be to make clear what we mean about when we're talking about gender equality, being inclusive, being diverse. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, and now we have certainly in the energy uh, field, energy transition field, we're talking about being fair and just, okay? so. We're adding additional, very complex uh, uh, and unclear uh, concept into our vocabulary, and it just makes our life slightly more difficult. It makes it more interesting, but it makes it a little bit more difficult. So I would stress that we really have to look at the goals that are achievable. Like I think that in Europe, uh, gender pay gap can be improved that is an achievable goal and there are policies in the uk where people have to remote re report on their uh, gender pay gap i think mainstreaming gender into budgeting in the european union that should be also an achievable goal because it can be measured and dg budget does look at the organizations and programs from that perspective mm -hmm. so i think we have some goals that can be achievable uh, empowering women i find that probably is not achievable sdg5 everybody face failing on sdg5 okay so let's just start with laying out which goals are achievable. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, a little bit what also Andrea was saying, starting from the values. And while we run uh, towards the goals, there are obstacles. Costanza, please. Yes, thanks for the, the question. Is the question, actually, and it's super interesting. But first, um, I wanted to give you an emotional reaction to the video, which obviously I know, but every time gives me emotion, especially towards the end, you know, when there is this very American, indeed, Elizabeth, uh, um, empowerment message saying, yes, of course, we can do it. We can do it exactly even better, but at least at the same, uh, with, the, with the same results. And my thinking is immediately, yes, but how much F harder it is, right? So <laughs> it gives me a little bit of um, thinking because it is harder. And here I come to the, to the second point, perhaps. Um, until it keeps being harder, I think that positive actions are justified uh because because it is and uh, it shouldn't be and societal change doesn't happen within one generation let's just think about lgbtiq plus rights there is indeed a lot of societal change 
in uh, in our generation, in the next generation, etc. But uh, it it took a lot of of time with them, and, and it's the same with many other things. And the second point is a point of comparison. I have, I do uh, second and share Sylvia's vision that um, um, gender should be like any other characteristic. So it shouldn't be a, a factor that determines the way in which you are treated at work, but in any other case. And yet, um, before working on gender equality, I used to work on race and ethnic discrimination. And uh, there is a lot of discussion um, in that field as well, and also um, a lot of experience about uh, colorblind versus race conscious policies. And um, I am definitely among uh, those who support the idea that until the race is a um, category that is relevant in in the head of those who discriminate, then it should be relevant for policy as well. And as a matter of fact, the majority of my black friends would tell me, don't you see I am black? So treat me uh, like uh, people who see me as black would treat me in the positive way, taking into account how negative it is the negative way. So uh, to me, the um, short answer is, of course, Sylvia, the, the goal you describe is the goal we should be uh, looking at. I don't think it is within reach any time soon because of all our experiences, but also simply because this, I mean, you see legislation, we still talk about men and women and we are stuck there. So we're ages away. So I think that gender conscious policies are uh, are still very important uh, yeah and positive actions with very good annika would you like <laughs> to go next uh, yes um thank you i think i can um agree totally with what you just said constanza uh, constanza sorry um i think yes the film showed the big problem we still have in our society, that we still associate gender with certain attributes and how much our society and environment still has to change, therefore. Um, and yes, to refer to your question, I think the final goal would be maybe living in a diverse world so that attributes that currently count as diversity dimensions become features such as colors of your eyes or hair. But until then, um, I also agree, um, I think we have to be realistic. And I think as long as um, women or transgender or genderqueer people experience more violence, higher risk for poverty, less access to education, it is important to name the reasons they are being discriminated for. So that's maybe, yes, <laughs> short Absolutely. and easy. Yeah, short and <laughs> very you. effective. Thanks, Annika. <laughs> uh, this will lead to a question I have for later on language, but Andrea first, please. <laughs> So, can I add something, uh, Ilaria, to that? Please, uh, please. Debate. So, please, you I think we, we we are all very pri privileged to uh, to spend uh, one and an hour to to debate about gender equality. So, uh, we are thinking of what the final goal could be. So, I think it's quite of a privileged uh, uh, work we have to spend time to discuss this. Uh, it's uh, some philosophical uh, questions are coming up. So I think we have to keep in mind that uh, we have a very good quality of life. I mean, you, you and you, we all, yeah. Um, so we always have to keep in mind this first, yeah. So the group, the group I'm leading um, in, the, in the international um, regulators, agencies, uh, 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 network women in energy um, across continents we focus on mid-career women it's from the they are from the generation x um, because we believe that they are the ones who have a decisive influence on both the soon to be departing workforce the baby boomers right and the younger generation the set generation uh, sylvia was was mentioning this uh, um, these categories, I think it's very, very important to know that uh, these um, generations have different values, 
they have a different starting point, they have a uh, different quality of life, uh, which for, for, for them is, 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 is normal, right? Which has not been normal for, for baby boomers, for, for instance. So uh, when bringing together these uh, women and to focus on them and we empower them in our program, I'm reflecting on an everyday basis why I'm doing it. Uh, and I'm doing it because I think that we in the energy sector and the regulators have a role because we are regulating a universal good. So it's not just energy, but it's made, uh, it's, it makes our living. Yes, we need energy for our daily life. And that's why I think we need to empower these women. In the video, we have seen uh, a girl who said, I know I, I would like to run like, I, like myself. Yeah. So first, I think we have to know who we are if we want to engage in gender equality programs, who we are. Yeah. But then there comes the barrier, I would say, OK, I know who I am. I have my identity. I'm Andrea. But once I come into a group, once I come to my workplace, to my department, to my unit, to the institution I work in, I'm still an individual. Yeah, I have my identity, but I also have to adapt to this environment. So um, finding the, the red line uh, to, to my first um, statement of the first question, from Sylvia, respect are two values. And the good thing when talking in values is that they regulate each other. I give you an example. I say tolerance is a very high value. I'm the boss of a unit and I tolerate that our unit meetings, they only start Nine o'clock after all mothers are to school. Okay. And then there is one person who doesn't even respect this timing, which is already very generous. So, okay, one time I can say, okay, I excuse, I'm tolerant. Yeah. But if this person does this three times, it's a miss, it's a disrespect to the others. So I think already identity, okay. But then uh, we are living in a society, we are living in a group, right? And then there are different values, which kind of must, you know, be on a hierarchy levels. That's, that's my opinion on this. So if we have to, if we want to live together, uh, and I mean, I'm not talking about shortages of profession, where we want to uh, hire anybody, because just there are no waiters anymore who want to uh, work as a waiter. We have this in Austria with this case. So we have to, to have uh, a working atmosphere who is attracting a lot of different people who, of course, will bring in all their different aspects and all their different perspectives. And this will, again, contribute to the fact that we are doing good things and we are creating good ideas, which all will serve to our um, keeping the level of our quality of life. Thank you, Andrea. Very wise. Um, I think, Costanza, maybe you wanted to add uh, some further point before uh, final considerations from Silvia. Just um, very quickly, and maybe can be addressed uh, later, or Silvia is also a question question for you perhaps. Um, to the extent uh, that um, I can see this in terms of goals and approach to goals, I think that indeed you, you highlighted the right uh, question, especially in order to operationalize for an organization how to achieve uh, uh, SDG 5, how to promote gender equality. Um, objectives need to be defined and an approach as well. Um, and uh, considering your question, I see a spectrum with two hands, uh, more or less. One is uh, having a gender blind approach, 
Okay. And another one is having an approach that not only is gender um, conscious, but also pursues actually actively uh, gender equality in the way in which we can define it. But there is a middle point, which I think uh, is the um, do no harm, is a, is a do no harm uh, principle that we can apply to gender equality. Of course, for an organization, a company, a public regulator, uh, it means uh, being gender conscious because you cannot uh, know if you are doing harm or not doing harm unless you do some sort of gender impact assessment or gender budget, or gender audit. Uh, but uh, it uh, it means being doing something uh, without perhaps being doing positive actions, but at least calculating what our internal and uh, external effects are and once again sorry if i if i keep stressing that i think that we can on these as well learn a lot from the environmental sustainability toolkit uh, from the esg toolkit from what has been done in the past in order to ensure that at least from the environmental point of view the do no harm principle is respected i think we could um we could borrow from there um, maybe Ilaria, just uh, maybe to wrap up on the on the yes. third question and the video. I, I take it from where uh, Costanza. I, I think Costanza, you, you you spoke my words. You know, <laughs> with your two interventions, I do recognize uh, that there is really a balance. Uh, we want to have a gender blind in the future, but we need to acknowledge what is it uh, the diversity. What does that mean? The burden that we are coming into a workplace with and this is really a, a, a constant balance sometimes what I, I feel is that this balance is a bit like that like the final goal is not inclusion inclusion is the way the final goal is really to recognize that there is really nothing to recognize about we are all different this is the status quo we want to achieve and there is nothing really break through uh, into that uh, we uh, acknowledge all diversity and as features but uh, it's really a balance it's a long way uh, to arrive there and definitely if the way to arrive there is with affirmative action or positive discrimination i'm definitely all for it but uh, i have the feeling sometimes uh, the really final final goal uh, is not there all the time and this is at least um, at least my consideration in, with my experience in the workplace and maybe one other consideration is that um, i think it is very important definitely to include uh, all people with different uh, features or or different characteristics in the policies uh, because uh, who can speak better than a woman on what is does it mean to be a woman, but is it really so in the long term? So should the representation really be carried out by uh, those who carry the, you know, uh, the feature? In other terms, the gender balance, is it an issue for everyone or is it an issue only for women or for less represented gender? I think it's an issue for everyone. And for example, I have a bit of a cringe all the time. I see, you know, programs for management for women huh? okay this is a, a bit of my like oh my god are we still there i will follow myself a, a leadership program for women if i found that they organize a leadership program for men okay or for anyone else as it matter so this is still on, on some of these issues I'm still cringing but um yeah i leave it now to uh, Ilaria, thank you very much, everybody, for replying to my questions. Silvia, thank you very much for such a, an interesting and thought-raising presentation. I think we all loved it, really, uh, and it helped us uh, reflecting even more and loud. I don't see um, questions in the Q&A, so I could figure, really, our participants taking notes and... Uh, <laughs> That's probably what's happening. Anyway, I, I repeat my invitation. I reiterate my invitation to write any question. But uh, in the meantime, we can have our, uh, let's say, uh, what was to, proposed to be introductory. It's not introductory. It's almost close to final, let's say, rounds of uh, interventions from our speakers. Um, 
If I may, I would like to refocus a little bit on the title. You said so many things, many interesting things. A little bit on the title of uh, our um, our online debate. So refocusing, if you can, in your uh, five minutes intervention in uh, on uh, you know the um, application implementation of uh, uh, gender inclusion policies in uh, in workplaces because we heard and particularly I think uh, question number two from Silvia was uh, encouraging you know to uh, come up with uh, practical pragmatic solutions on how to do that on how to make sure that these policies are effective and what instead are the limits the obstacles that we discussed a lot and uh, I was just on top of my mind, I was thinking, you know, the importance of language, uh, you know, in uh, working places, in the culture of working places, um, how this can be a little bit steered uh, without getting to, uh, you know, extremes, but, you know, as to make sure that um, it is inclusive, also the language that, uh, that we use. And also, um, we recently attended a, a, a meeting of the DGN Equality Platform, which was extremely interesting on LGBTQ+. Um, and uh, there, I think it emerged clearly in the discussion how important mentoring is, particularly, you know, in companies uh, who have this culture, who have started implementing and working on this culture, uh, how important it is for uh, a staff member to see to picture himself or herself in you know in uh, um, uh, other colleagues that are uh, mentoring in that sense and do uh, constitute a role model so that's enough from me for for food for thought and uh, i would now start the um, the debate the the round of interventions uh, with elizabeth five minutes thanks okay. Well, thank you so much. It's good to have one first. So it's uh, first the thing about the mentoring. Indeed, many, many, many mentoring schemes have been produced and done, and many of them are really bad. But there are some examples of really good mentoring schemes. That, and if it depends where it is done and what, how much resources is put into the effort, there's been very good mentoring scheme at the Sun Microsystems, where they actually they could demonstrate that over several years it produced a benefit to the bottom line of the company, which is really what private industry is looking at. Uh, so yes, it one has to just really be very careful how one design mentoring scheme. We are currently in uh, several projects, and uh, you know, uh, Porsche, my organization, was. Uh, uh, incorporated in 2001, all right? So you can see that we've been working in this area for many, many years. But right now, the areas are that we are in, looking at is basically energy, okay? So questions that come up is, is, is gender balance in energy sector possible, okay? And where, so part of the SINA uh, project study was to look at different sectors or different renewable sectors, and you cannot just bundle them together because they are different. So hydrogen is different to wind energies because there are different jobs and uh, some are more manual, some are more research based. So one has to look uh, also at the pipeline. What is the reality of the pipeline of women coming in, staying in the sector, or maybe what is kind of a career mobility possible for them? Uh, yes, and so the, this thing about is gender balance uh, at all achievable in some sectors. Then in the, certainly in academia and she figures, so looking at the gender balance uh, in academia, that has been a question for many, many years. And uh, certainly at the leadership level, there's always big problems. And the question then has to be, is gender balance the solution for being for universities to be equal, diverse and uh, inclusive? Or is it really a matter of culture? So in the fields where there are certainly male dominated, like engineering or uh, physics, where it might take years before we can actually uh, uh, increase, this, really increase the numbers of women at the decision-making roles, can we just change the culture itself? And will Horizon Europe with the requirement of gaps actually make a difference? And how are we going to demonstrate that actually uh, Horizon Europe will make a difference because we can demonstrate that. 
But I really also want to stress how important it is to show that there are examples of good practice, that we are not just fighting this problem endlessly at the problem, that people have actually developed uh, ways of achieving change. And this, uh, so we always like to give people the good news, it is possible to achieve change, okay? But it does require commitment and resources and people and, uh, and long-term commitment, not just something that you put into a policy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Andrea, your turn. Thank you, Ilaria. Well, we're talking about today gender equality. Uh, gender equality, uh, I would say it's a change management process. And as this word uh, insinuates, it's a process. It can be a lengthy process. Okay. So um, as, I, as I said before, I mean, we are privileged to talk about this, this, this topic in a not, not of profit or in a, in a regulator's institute perspective, right? So, but there are companies and money makes the world go round, we know, and they said that uh, gender diverse companies are more profitable they found in a 2018 McKinsey study. So if I replace the word profitable by the word of high performing, contributing to society, contributing to the wealth of society, I can say that gender equality is a process which is worth to tackle and to, to start and to continue. Okay, so what we do in the Women in Energy Network, okay, we can say, or well, we know we are very, very uh, uh, we are very conscious about the fact that we cannot uh, start a, a change management pro process, right, a a across across the world. I mean, it would be nice to to be able to do so, but I think this is not realistic. And we heard today that goals should be realistic. So what we are doing, we um, design programs, which in fact tackle the expectations of women who want to be and to act and to work as high performers in regulatory agencies. So we ask them, we talk to them, and they tell us two things. They tell us, I want to gain leadership skills. Yes, they tell us. And they want to expand their strategic network. So first, when I was reading these answers, uh, or hearing them, because they also say so uh, when you talk to them, uh, I was thinking, oh my gosh, how can you help somebody to expand her network, right? And we found our ways to do so both uh, in the form of our peer coaching program. This is now the, the big brother or the little sister or the big sister, <laughs> or you name it, of the mentoring program, which was um, established and uh, well performed by, by my predecessor, Una Shorto. Um, we worked together in the CR Secretariat uh, then. And it, it seems that our ways uh, crossed a second time. So I have now taken over the Women in Energy Initiative from UNA. And I was always saying to myself, OK, mentoring, yes. But this is not at the same level, right? This is from senior to junior. Yeah? So OK, a senior can tell a junior yeah, how, to, how the work functions, how the world works, right? What I wanted to see is to see women across continents to exchange problems, ideas, to test their arguments with a peer, with another woman, with another person, in this case, a woman. Our program just focuses for simplicity issues <laughs> uh, on women. Uh, and they exchange their ideas across continents. So to change perspective and to develop something different, something different they could not develop if they were sitting on their desk in, in, in their home country, right? So um, what they tell us from the program, because uh, one, um, one 
edition of the program uh, has already been closed this year um, is that they that their cooperation was very fruitful. Of course, it's always about relationship. It's about respect, of course. Um, it's about giving insight in your daily job, but also in your life. So again, here we cannot distinguish, we cannot separate. So um, it's a very fruitful and a very um, big learning uh, they report us. So. And since this was successful, we go into the second edition. There will be iteration of the program um, and, and the call early next year. Um, and having said this, I also want to stick to your, um, to your buzzwords. You said language. Uh, we don't focus on language issues. Um, why? Because I think that gender equality is more than language. It's beyond language. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's always better to have uh, something concrete to do, to have a program, to act like a good role model uh, than to, to, to say what you should say or sh you should not say. I mean, that's my approach. And apparently um, uh, this, this works out in this case. What we also do is we have a network. We have a networking circle. And we're also cooperating with the Florence School of Regulation. Um, I would also like to invite uh, other the participants and other, um, other speakers of today to also um, talk to us, to, to contact us, and maybe we also find uh, other cooperation uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks a lot. Um, I would go to Annika now. Yes, there we go. Perfect, thank you. Um, and thanks again for initiating this great event and for all these interesting contributions we've, we've already heard. Um, I have to be honest and maybe relating to some of the arguments we've discussed before, hearing about the latest numbers regarding violence against women, transgender, genderqueer people, um, now the latest femicide in Italy. It's sometimes not easy to focus on only one aspect, in our case, gender equality in the workplace, um, instead of addressing or feeling the urge of addressing several issues at once. Nonetheless, it emphasizes again the importance of events like this one here today. Um, during a different FSR setting earlier this year, my dear colleague Dagmar During mentioned um, that societal changes such as the energy transition can only be mastered together. Change requires the effort of all and to think of all to make it sustainable. However, when we look at gender equality in the business world, we still see persistent gaps. They manifest in terms of pay, care, the labor market, participation in decision-making processes, career mobility and advancement, or energy-related education. Um, at our company, Landwehr, we're trying our best to constantly work on closing these gaps. We're proud to have reached a women's rate of more than half of our workforce and an even higher one in management which shows that the industry does not have to remain mainly male and that change is possible if we allow it. Furthermore, we think that empowerment and mutual support, um, such as a mentoring program or also beyond the company scope, are crucial on our way towards equality and inclusion. Um, and one perfect example is the Lucha Award, I think, for collective engagement that showed how a small idea can turn into something great. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little more about our diversity team. In 2021, during a casual work event, a couple of people, mostly women, had a vivid discussion about gender inequality and sexism in various aspects of our daily lives. And although we had not made any negative experiences at our company, we all quickly agreed that there's so much more that we could and wanted to do. And after addressing these thoughts to our CEO, and its immediate approval, it only took a couple of days for us to establish a diversity task force, which then eventually led to our diversity team. Um, here I have to add that this is a role we fill on top of our main tasks. Um, following the intersectionality approach presented by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, also something we've already addressed during the discussion earlier, um, which aims to shed light on how multiple dimensions and systems of inequality interact with one another, we started our mission. And luckily at Landwehr, we could already build on an established culture of acceptance and openness and empowerment. 
to give you a quick insight maybe into what we're doing, um, I think we can cluster our recent activities into four groups. The first would be focusing on raising awareness because I think that's always um, the base for, for further activities or policies. Um, so we do this by organizing short lectures and discussions or keynotes from external experts. Then furthermore, we organize specific workshops, for example, um, on ways of using gender neutral language or on how to deal with discrimination, both as person directly affected or as possible ally. And thirdly, we've addressed some of our existing processes, for example, parts of our recruitment process, um, because we need to be evolving, <laughs> as we said before, um, along with our HR department in order to make these job descriptions and our career website inclusively appeal to everyone. Um, and moving further than the so far binary gender system. And last but not least, we try to educate ourselves to be able to pass along more and more know-how. Therefore, we seek the exchange with and the expertise of other diversity teams, um, signed to German Charter of Diversity, and hope to participate in many more conferences and debates and events like this one here today. And I think in general, we can say that based on what we've learned during these last two years, we think that in order to create sustainable outcomes and benefits, we need to actively enhance awareness building and cultural change alongside concrete policies. And here, I'd also like to add that I'm very glad to work at a company that also acknowledges and takes on social responsibility, because I think organizations have the power and possibility to reach a wide range of people by setting an example or raising awareness within companies, um, we might also impact people's private lives and surroundings and thus leading to a much bigger impact than initially thought. And that's something I'm very proud of and thankful um, to our company and our CEO for providing the resources and furthermore empowering us and supporting this cause. But yes, um, talking about barriers or limits, um, of course, there's a but. <laughs> we also agree that there's still a lot to be done within our company, but also in the industry and our society in total. Starting with our own scope of action, we currently face a couple of questions. Um, for example, after raising awareness, what's next? Are specific mm -hmm. policies indispensable? And how do we reach people who worry about too much change or just don't see the necessity because they still exist? <laughs> and is it enough to tackle these challenges um, we have on top of our main tasks? Or would it be necessary to prioritize and implement structural change, such as a full-time position or even more? And, well, a general question, why is the energy industry still led by men? And how do we change systematic inequalities? Those are big questions, and I think it shows that, and we're quite aware that we have a long way to go, but we are committed to the goal of contributing as an organization to these changes, um, well, cultural, societal, or political changes that are necessary in order to enhance the transition to a fully green and more sustainable energy supply. And I think we consider it as given that this is only possible by providing an environment in which everyone no matter their gender, has the possibility to reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annika, for this, uh, for sharing these best practices and also anecdotes. Uh, it's very important to raise awareness for sure. And uh, it's good to uh, uh, work in a place where you can just raise ideas and uh, there is the understanding. No? Yes. <laughs> um, Costanza, we have only a few minutes uh, but, and we are approaching the conclusion of the debate. Um, please. I'll try to be as short as possible, but uh, let me let me make uh, two points, uh, which I think cover the reason why Ilaria invited uh, to join me the panel today, because I will try to address uh, the um, question she um, she asked uh, uh, to us uh, in, at the very end, uh, which is the title of our session. So what policies in the workplaces and there is the language issue as well. Uh, I would like to, to uh, answer that question with two provocations that are related to the thing I do, actually the projects I pursue uh, at work. Uh, the first has very much to do with something that uh, Silvia was mentioning. Uh, gender equality can also be pursued via training programs and empowerment, but I grew up in this conviction uh, recently that they don't need 
to be focused on women, rather they should be focused on gatekeepers and incumbent leadership. And therefore, what I have developed over the past three, four years, not without difficulties, I have to admit, is um, is, uh, um, training, um, training courses and uh, even, yes, and training initiatives for uh, management and uh, mainly targeting uh, male management on gender equality. And uh, what uh, what I've been uh, proposing in these trainings are two things that cover different things that uh, we have been discussing today. Uh, one aspect has to do um, in a sense with the business case for inclusion, diversity, etc. cetera. Uh, now, uh, they, these trainings have been uh, mainly addressed to uh, policymakers. And therefore, I wouldn't uh, um, talk about a business case in the sense that uh, uh, business and management uh, reviews uh, would do, but it's rather the um, added value and societal benefit for everybody of having more um, gender equality, especially in leadership of uh, of public organizations in terms of macroeconomic analysis, for instance, no gender budgeting and gender analysis of public budgets. But the second part is very much about raising awareness of unconscious biases, including in terms of language and microbehavior within an organization and biases in companies and the biases in in public administrations uh, or academic organization, I think are very much comparable. Which brings me to the the part about uh, language and um, and, uh, and mentoring as well. I think that reverse mentoring is is an interesting tool to be used in this case. Reverse mentoring sometimes is referred to when we talk about uh, junior people mentoring other people. In this case, when we discuss gender equality, I think uh, the, the way in which I conceive it is having women mentoring men on how to address certain situations or gender fluid or uh, LGBTIQ plus people mentoring senior leadership or human resources director who might not be, maybe are well aware from the point of view of background knowledge, but not on the point of view of behavioral approach or interpersonal approach. And uh, the last point, always on what we can do at the workplace, to me is enhancing transparency of uh, the flow of money and the flow of value that uh, we take from society and we create from society via uh, gender budgeting uh, processes, which will not account only for heads, but also for services and goods uh, produced and also the the economic value. Costanza, thanks a lot. This this debate was really fascinating. Uh, It's the first time I hear about reverse uh, mentoring, for example, I think, uh, and I hope that it was a learning experience for uh, uh, all of our participants. So I I would really like to thank all the the speakers in today's debate, Silvia Manessi, Costanza Hermanin, Andrea Lenauer, Annika Beiner and Elizabeth Politzer. Uh, I would like to thank also my colleague, uh, Tomiri Samirova, who has been instrumental in organizing this debate. A big hi to Alberto Potosnik, who's usually my uh, co-host, uh, not today, but uh, uh, he's uh, with us in spirit for sure. Uh, I would just at least three takeaways. These are not, do not have the ambitions to be the conclusions because we, uh, <laughs> we really um, discuss several topics, but um, I think what we, uh, what I take away is that there is indeed a discrepancy in uh, reality between reality and this uh, uh, inclusion uh, policies and implementation, which hasn't really been captured or even understood. So there is a lot of work to do in raising awareness. We don't need to label, I heard, we just need to run away from definitions. Let's focus instead on values, on tolerance, on inclusion, and hopefully this will help um, uh, will help us keeping away from restricting too much uh, the implementation of rules. Uh, let's focus also on the obstacles. They need to be tangible, they need to be um, uh, defined. Um, for example, gender, gender pay gap, 
uh, okay, but what's the goal? The goal is that uh, we need to have uh, a clear, um, clear medium uh, targets. Uh, we have to have an idea of what is actually useful uh, for the uh, for our uh, own goals, for our tailor tailor made goals, tailored to the organization. And I think implementing equality and inclusion in workplace is a long process. Uh, I think it was uh, Costanza who said, I don't see it happening anytime soon. So we all are aware of that. It will be a step-by-step -step process, uh, but the, I like the do no harm um, principle. That, uh, that means that um, if we can't have at the moment or immediately gender blind policies, we uh, should at least uh, make sure that organizations are at least gender conscious, so they're at least not totally blind, I would say, at least uh, aware of, uh, of the issues that we discussed. Uh, I hope you agree with this, uh, <laughs> very basics, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm aware that the, this, the debate is not over. Actually, I look forward to continuing it with you. And we are all, you know, uh, of course, available to uh, uh, for, for more cooperation initiatives to, uh, with each and all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And till the next occasion soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day.